Good morning, beloved. We're now in the part of our service where we can worship God through the public reading of Scripture. So today we'll be reading through 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 8 to 34. So I'll, I'll give you a chance to turn to it, but it's in 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 8 to 34. And if you do have one of these blue Bibles on you, we're going to be on page 357. So our reading begins on verse 8. In the 26th year of Asa, king of Judah, Elah, son of Basha, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Terzah two years. Zimri, one of his officials, who had command of half his chariots, plotted against him. Elah was in Terzah at the time, getting drunk in the home of Arza, the palace administrator at Terzah. Zimri came in, struck him down, and killed him in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah. Then he succeeded him as king. As soon as he began to reign and was seated on the throne, he killed off Basha's whole family. He did not spare a single male, whether relative or friend. So Zimri destroyed the whole family of Basha in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken against Basha through the prophet Jehu. Because of all the sins Basha and his son Elah had committed and had caused Israel to commit, so that they aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, by their worthless idols. As for the other events of Elah's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Verse 15. In the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned in Terzah seven days. The army was encamped, encamped near Gibbethon, a Philistine town. When the Israelites in the camp heard that Zimri had plotted against the king and murdered him, they proclaimed Omri, the commander of the army, king over Israel that very day there in the camp. Then Omri and all the Israelites with him withdrew from Gibbethon and laid siege to Terzah. When Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the royal palace and set the palace on fire around him. So he died, because of the sins he had committed, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord and following the ways of Jeroboam and committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit. As for the other events of Zimri's reign and the rebellion he carried out, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Then the people of Israel were split into two factions. Half supported Tibni, son of Ginath, for king, and the other half supported Omri. But Omri's followers proved stronger than those of Tibni's son of Ginath. So Tibni died and Omri became king. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri became king of Israel and he reigned 12 years, six of them in Terzah. He bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver and built a city on the hill calling it Samaria after Shemer the name of the former owner of the hill. But Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all those before him. He followed completely the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit, so that they had roused the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, by the worthless idols. As for the other events of Omri's reign, when he did and the things that he achieved, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Omri rested with his ancestors and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab, his son, succeeded him as king. Verse 29. In the thirty-eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over t Israel twenty-two years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He only not considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. In Ahab's time, Heel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, you're reading the introduction to Ahab there, um, given that you're going to be preaching on Ahab next week. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. If we haven't met, my name's Ben. Um, I'm one of the members of the body of Christ here, called to work side by side with you. I love that. I love the interview that we had a little bit earlier. And that is um, the way I see myself, uh, just a member of the body of Christ. But you've called me to come and to pastor, to teach the word and, uh, and to, to pray for you and to walk with you, and uh, together with Shady on leave and um, Casey as well. Uh, can you 
um, keep your Bibles open because we're going to move through chapter 15 and 16 really rapidly. Uh, you remember what we like to do is we like to look at what the Bible's saying in its original context. Then we look at what it's saying about Jesus and we think of how that applies to us. And I'm going to begin back in chapter 15, verse 25. So you might need to turn your Bibles back just one page. Uh, we are going to move swiftly. Don't uh, stay with me. Don't get lost. It's a bit of a wild ride. Let's pray. Lord God, we uh, know that you have spoken through your word and the prophets in days of old and through the nation of Israel. And these things are not just history, but they become your prophetic words spoken to foreshadow the coming of Christ in whose time we live. He's come, he's lived, he's died, he's been raised and now he reigns. And we pray that you'd gift us your spirit this morning that we'd rightly hear your word and grow in our faith in him living as faithful subjects of his kingdom. So we pray in his name. Amen. Well, let the viewing begin. Who has watched the Tour de France already? Stage one started last night. Thank you very much. There's a few sporting people out there. Um, you can either do the 10 o'clock till 3 a.m. option every night for the next 23, four nights, or you can do what I do, just grab the 10-minute summary uh, in the morning. It's great. Uh, a 10-minute review of world-class cycling every morning. And then uh, on the 27th of July, the Olympics begin for more than two weeks. So isn't that good? We've got three weeks of tour, two weeks of Olympics, and then the Tour de Femme begins after that, usually straight after Tour de France, but the women are going around after the Olympics. And so we have six weeks of back-to-back -back sport viewing, watching, strap in. Um, it'll be great. I love watching the best in the world. Uh, it doesn't really matter what sport it is if the best in the world are doing it. It's poetry in motion. So say for individual sports, you know, someone's able to move their body with agility, strength, endurance, maybe a combination of all those things in a way that they actually rise to the top, pushing the boundaries of human endeavour, stretching the limits of freedom more than any other. Or... Uh, if it's team sport, it also incorporates the strategy of a team actually working in a coordinated fashion to outplay the opposing team. I mean, if every individual member just went out there to shine in and of themselves individually, uh, completely free from limiting their own effort in a way to harness the efforts of the team, then the team would be quickly defeated. I mean, like, like when you watch five-year-olds playing soccer, right? I mean, have you ever done that? It's great fun. Despite the fact that there are 22 kids in two different colours on the field, uh, everyone's actually playing for themselves. Uh, they wouldn't have a clue where their teammates are or how they might use team strategy. They just get the ball, put their head down and go for it, sometimes not even in the right direction. Every kid's doing their best individual effort, playing with total freedom, but it's total chaos. And in our reading of 1 Kings today, we will see that selfish ambition with total freedom brings total chaos. You remember that the kingdom of Israel has been split in two. There's a southern kingdom and a north. And the southern kingdom has a monarchy in the line of David. So much like the English monarchy, there's no second guessing who the king might be. Uh, God had made a promise to David that one in his line would rule for, on the throne forever. So there was a royal line and the eldest son in the royal household was raised from a young age to be the heir. And when Jeroboam became king in the north... The word of the Lord came through a hijah. If you walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes, I'll be with you and I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David. So there was scope for this line of succession in the northern kingdom at the very beginning. But the hope for a royal dynasty in this line has been shattered by Jeroboam's rebellion. That's what we've had in the last few weeks. He's led Israel astray from worshipping God's way at the temple, through the priesthood, at the festivals instituted by God. And the next word of the Lord that comes to him through Ahijah was, I'm going to bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I'll cut off from Jeroboam every last male in Israel, slave or free. I'll burn up the house of Jeroboam as one burns dung until it's all gone. Dogs will eat those belonging to Jeroboam who die in the city, and the birds of the air will feed on those who die in the country. Sounds nasty? Well, it was really nasty. 
And today as we begin to read on these chapters of 15 and 16, we're going to see the chaos and the destruction break loose in the north as selfish ambition reigns supreme. And the people of Israel are led astray from God and they suffer the consequences. So have you got your Bibles open? Here we go. Wake yourself up. Uh, If you flick back to chapter 15, verse 25, we see the first transition in kingship from father to son, Jeroboam to Nadab. It says, Nadab, son of Jeroboam, became king of Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and he reigned over Israel two years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following his ways of his father and committing the same sin his father had caused Israel to commit. Just a heads up, as you read through Kings, there's a pretty standard couple of notes at the introduction of every king. The first is how long they reign for, and the second is a sentence summary on whether or not they were faithful. And uh, a bit of a spoiler, most of them weren't, okay? So Nadab, uh, he doesn't last long as king, less than two years, and a certain Basha decides that he wants the throne. And so while Nadab and his army are besieging a Philistine town, Baasha strikes him down and assumes the throne. In fact, in chapter 15, verse 29, as soon as Baasha began to reign, he killed Jeroboam's whole family. He did not leave Jeroboam anyone that breathed, but but destroyed them all according to the word of the Lord given through his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. This happened because the sins of Jeroboam had committed and had caused Israel to commit and because he aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel. Wow. It's an assassination and then a slaughter of the royal household. It's pretty barbaric stuff, really. And if it would make international headlines if it happened in our world today. And depending on where it happened in the world, that it'd probably come under trial and be dealt with swiftly and severely. And yet here... That assassination and subsequent slaughter of the royal household is according to the word of the Lord. Did you get that in verse 29? Uh, it's a bit of a shock, really, quite confronting. How, how, do you think this sort of, how do you think of this sort of stuff in the Old Testament? Um, Richard Dawkins, an atheist, says that the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, philicidal, pestilential and megalomaniacal, I can't even say it, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capricious, capriciously malevolent bully. There you go. Does it embarrass you to hear something like that? I mean, when when Basha goes on his killing spree, and it's according to the word of the Lord, no doubt there's probably a battle going on in your mind that's pretty hard to engage with. So I want to help you there. There are a few things that I keep in mind when I'm reading the Scriptures like that. Certainly on one hand, some of the stuff in the Scriptures is descriptive. It's not prescriptive. That is, the Bible often describes bad behavior of people without explicitly calling it out. And so that doesn't mean that the Bible condones it. But secondly, and even in instances like this, just because God declares that he will judge Jeroboam and deprive him of descendants, that doesn't mean that God actually condones the way in which Baasha did it, that he assassinated the king and then he went on to slaughter all the royal family. I mean, God had simply declared that Jeroboam's line would come to an end. Basha is actually acting out of selfish ambition and he's using brutal violence. Now, two things can coexist. The evil of man and the sovereign will of a good God. God can use evil to achieve his purposes. Basha can't justify or sanctify what he did as God's work. In fact, we're going to see that he comes under the very same judgment which he executed. But whilst we're thinking about this, I also want to say that it is true, and this is the hardest thing to stomach in the Old Testament, that sometimes God does explicitly command his people to execute very severe judgment in the Old Testament. Again, that's not what's actually happening here in 1 Kings, uh, but there are helpful ways to reconcile that too. It has to do with the severity of sin, the justice of God, and the eternal judgment 
that's actually brought forward into time and place. But that's discussions for another time. For now, what we have here in 1 Kings is evil men behaving badly and the kingdom of Israel is spiralling out of control. Baasha is now king. And we're going to walk through these next five kings pretty swiftly. See there in verse 33, it tells us that Baasha reigned for 24 years. Now, it may well be that he's so ambitious and he's so brutal that he manages to, in a dictatorial kind of way, squash all rebellion and give himself a stable reign. He was the third longest reigning king in the northern kingdom, actually. But despite the length of his reign, the time given to him in the scriptures is really short because these are prophetic histories. When we read these histories, we're not thinking it's recording every significant detail of a nation. Uh, kings aren't evaluated for their faithfulness to God. Uh, sorry, they are evaluated for their faithfulness to God. They're not evaluated according to their building projects or the stability of their reign or their length of reign or their international exploits. And so the word of the prophet Yehu comes to this king, Baasha, and see if it rings a bell. See if you recognize what he says in chapter 16, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Yehu, son of Hanani, concerning Baasha. I lifted you up from the dust and appointed you ruler over my people Israel, but you followed the ways of Jeroboam and caused my people Israel to sin and to arouse my anger by their sins. So I am about to wipe out Baasha and his house, and I'll make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Dogs will eat those belonging to Baasha who die in the city, and birds will feed on those who die in the country. Do you recognize that? Hopefully you do. It was the very word of judgment proclaimed on Jeroboam and his household. It was the very word of judgment that Baasha had executed on Jeroboam according to the word of the Lord. And now, because of his brutal and ungodly reign, because he walked in the ways of Jeroboam and of his sin, he's going to come under exactly the same judgment oracle as Jeroboam himself. And it's interesting because, can you see, Baasha lived long and he rested. He didn't have the brutal end that he gave Nadab and all his household. He rests and in his old age, Elah takes the throne. But oh my word, all hell is about to break loose upon Elah, Baasha's son. Elah is only on the throne for two years. And I'm now in verse 9. He's relaxing. He's enjoying a few wines with a mate up the road. Well, a few too many wines. He's getting drunk. And one of his officials, who's in charge of half of the king's chariots, Zimri is his name, he takes the opportunity of Elah being drunk and defenceless and he assassinates him. And then he goes on to slaughter the royal household. And so now Zimri's on the throne. He, he's killed off the royal household. He, he thinks he's got no more rivals to the throne. He thinks he's sitting pretty. He's having a post-campaign party, if you like. But he's made a grab for the throne above his station because he's forgotten he's only keeper of half the chariots. <laughs> it's seven days later and his boss, Omri, who's the commander of the whole army, is encamped with the army of near a Philistine town. And they hear that Zimri, Zimri has taken the throne. They're not happy. <laughs> They're on the job down near the Philistine town. So they proclaim Omri as king and the army withdraws from the Philistines and goes up to march against Zimri, who's only seven days into his reign, Zimri knows he's way out of his depth. And there in verse 18, I am now, when Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went into the city citadel of the royal palace and set the palace on fire around him. And so he died because of the sins he had committed, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord and following the ways of Jeroboam and committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit. You can see why this is a prophetic history, can't you? Like, it doesn't say, so he died, because he was an absolute tosser and foolishly opportunistic and killed the king whilst he was drunk, thinking that he could then live in luxury in the palace, but he didn't spare a thought for the fact that he actually had a commander over him in an army who might have other ideas. It doesn't say that at all. It says he died because of the sins he had committed, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord and walking in the ways of Jeroboam and in the sin he had committed and caused Israel to commit. You see, it's a prophetic history reminding the people of Israel who 
by the time it's all compiled uh, in exile, reminding them that sin brings God's judgment. So Omri, the commander of the, of the army, has made a grab for the throne, but in verse 21, so too has a fellow named Tibni. And we think, where on earth did Tibni come from? <laughs> we weren't expecting that, but anything goes in Israel at this point in time. So verse 21, then the people of Israel were split into two factions. Half supported Tibni, son of Ginath, for king. The other half supported Omri. Israel split 50-50. I mean, not too long ago it was split north and south, but now the north is split 50-50, numbers-wise, but not in might. Because Omri's got the army on his side, and at the moment in Israel, might is right. So verse 22, but Omri's followers proved stronger than those of Tibni, son of Ginnah. So Tibni died, and Omri became king. Tibni died. Yeah, I bet he did. Uh, not from old age or some disease, mind you, uh, but from ruthless and brutal infighting. And so with Omri uh, begins a, a generation dynasty, a three-generation dynasty. See, Omri, Ahab, Isaiah. Can you see I've colour-coordinated this? Jeroboam and son was Nadab and Basha, son was Elah. Then there was Zimri, just injected himself for seven days. And then there's Omri, Ahab, Ahaziah. And it actually spans 36 years, this little dynasty, a time of stability on the throne, but it's a time of idolatry and apostasy. Because take Omri, he's the grandfather of this dynasty. Twelve years in office he has, and all he's known for is in verse 24, he bought a hill. He bought a hill, the hill of Samaria from Shemini for two talents of silver, built a city on the hill, calling it Samaria after Shema, the name of the former owner of the hill. And if you recognise that name Samaria, you're right. Became the capital of the northern kingdom. And by the time Jesus turns up, the Samar Samaritans are the people descended from these people here. But apart from that, the only other thing that was said of him certainly wasn't worth boasting about in verse 25. But Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all those before him. He followed completely the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit so that they aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, by their worthless idols. The kingdom of Israel is as bad as it's ever been. But it's not as bad as it will get. Just in the next generation, verse 29, Ahab comes to the throne. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. He reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years, another long reign. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. And he not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. And Ahab also had an Asherah pole, did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. Well, if you hadn't heard of or remembered the name of Ahab, well, you're going to remember that over the next three weeks. Okay, we've just got a little introduction to him here, not saying anything because I'm not going to steal Raph's thunder next week. Um, but if you hadn't heard of Ahab, then you certainly would have heard the name Jezebel. Anyone name their daughter Jezebel before I go? No one did. No, I didn't. wouldn't have thought so. Did anyone name their dog Jezebel? No, we're even safe there, aren't we? Okay. She was, she was a piece of work, I tell you. And uh, led all of Israel astray. Look, I give you this run through all of that really quickly to give you a sense of where things have got to. From the zenith of the kingdom, under the wisdom of Solomon, with peace and righteousness and justice and prosperity, such that even the Queen of Sheba in the east could see it, and she came running, to now, in Israel, when people are watching their backs, running for cover, there are assassinations and there are sieges and there are slaughters and there are suicides. And there's a rule of a king who considers it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, all in the space of seven generations, all in the space of about... Four chapters, really. Four or five chapters from 1 Kings 10 through to 1 Kings 15. So do you get the sense of where things have got to? The apostasy in the northern kingdom, of the chaos that's come with selfish ambition. Let's pull it all together. 
Back before, the Israel, before Israel went on a quest for the king, the last sentence of the book of Judges says, In those days, Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. There was the freedom of selfish ambition in all sorts, brought all sorts of grief and pain for the people of Israel. The book of Judges closed in an absolute mess, and their hope was that a king would come about and bring God's law and order, and as a result, righteousness and justice and flourishing amongst God's people. And it did for a time under David and then Solomon. But when the kings turned from the ways of the Lord and they pursued idols and ruled with selfish ambition, it could be said that in those days Israel had kings who did as they saw fit and it was chaos. And so as a close, I want you to imagine two different worlds. Can you first of all imagine a world where the thing that is prized above all else is individual self-expression? I mean, imagine a world like that. (laughs) Imagine a world where everyone is encouraged just to follow your dreams. You be you. You can be whoever you want to be. A world where the greatest ethic is self-expression and woe betide anyone who gets between that. You don't have to imagine too hard because that's actually the world in which we live. You know, in our day and age, statements like deny yourself, put others before yourself, Submit yourselves to one another. They're not very popular mantras at all. And yet where we see selfish ambition reign, there will be chaos. See, what if what I want to do cuts across what you want to do? Or what if the way I see the world cuts across the way you see the world? I mean, if it was the ancient world of one kings, then we just slaughter each other, right? (laughs) But you see, at the moment in the Western world, where personal freedoms are prized higher than anything else, we're tending to get a bit of chaos. I was listening to an interview uh, through the week where John Anderson, former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia and a Christian, was talking with Albert Moeller, who is a Southern Baptist minister in America and, um, and he's a social commentator. And they were talking about sort of what's happening in America and then uh, they were also talking about liberty and licentiousness and the difference between the two. Licentiousness is a free-for-all, total freedom, but it brings chaos and anarchy. Liberty, on the other hand, is freedom within constraints. It was never meant to be total freedom, liberty. It's always within constraints, and it brings life and community and harmony. And that's why the Lord Jesus is the perfect king. Philippians 2 reminds us he was in very nature God, He had all authority to reign uh, however he liked, but he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, to be held on to, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. See, Jesus had freedom. He was in very nature God, but he chose to exercise his freedom within the constraints of love. He chose to do nothing out of selfish ambition. He chose to put others' interests before his own. He chose to walk the way of servanthood. And we've just read a litany of kings who in rapid succession turn away from the Lord. They embrace paganism. They're prepared to lie, kill and steal to fulfill their selfish ambition. Whereas Jesus' ambition is to lay down his life. Friends, in the modern world, modern Western world in particular, we swim in the soup of self-determination. We're hearing all the time about the importance of the freedom of self-expression. So just this week, we hear a 29-year-old MP cross the floor at Parliament to vote against her party on something that wasn't declared a conscience vote. She said that she couldn't go against her conscience. Now, I, I'm not, I don't want to commentate on the content of what, she, of what she was voting on, but it's interesting, isn't it? Because she's saying that self-expression, what's here within, my conscience, is more important than the collective party line. And that was what was most astounding on this young woman, 29 years old. There's a change happening in society such that the freedom of self-expression is the greatest moral right. And we're swimming in that. 
we're soaking ourselves in that. If we're going to live according not to the kingdom of the world, but the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven, we need to soak ourselves in Jesus that it so deeply permeates us that we think completely differently. I want to take just a moment in some ways to give thanks for Rinska Moritz. Here was a woman, you knew her, um, who completely soaked herself in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It was so very deep within her that when she had her cancer diagnosis early this year, she was not ruffled by it. It was simply a blimp on her radar. Why? Because she was permeated with something subconsciously because she soaked herself in it all the time, the death and resurrection of Jesus. So she had a wonderful hope. That was very sure and certain. It was astounding to watch. It was a blessing to experience. So if we live in this world that soaks us in self-determination, self-expression, unless we soak ourselves in Jesus, we'll be won over by it. We've got to keep coming back to a world that's completely different. A world where self-denial and obedience to God is actually what's most important. A world where love of God and love of neighbour is treasured as the two great commands. A world where God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It would be a completely different world to the one we first imagined. We can see that. We can see something of that in the fellowship of believers. I think the, most, the greatest privilege of my job is actually mixing among so many of you uh, in a way that's quite close. I see people going out of their way to serve one another in love rather than to pursue selfish ambition. I see people remembering one another in grief. I see people helping one another with practical things. Uh, you know, I see people carrying the load for one another, lending cars, giving money, opening homes, giving the gift of company, encouraging people with their words, challenging people with their words, walking side by side with one another. I love it. I love watching what God's doing among you. It's better viewing than the Olympics, actually. It's better viewing than a team operating with strategy and skill to score goals and win games. It's actually the body of Christ using God's gifts to build one another up in love for the glory of Jesus. And how exciting is that to see that and be part of that? It's not just for the next six weeks. It's until our Lord Jesus returns and perfects the fellowship that we have in the new creation. There is a king among God's people. He's not living with selfish ambition. He has laid down his life for his friends. And as we soak ourselves in him, we lay down our lives for one another as well. So let's pray. Lord God, we uh, in some ways are so humbled to see this period of history in the kingdom of the north where selfish ambition reigns, where kings do what is right in their own eyes and there is chaos. We thank you that our Lord Jesus did not have eyes for himself, but had eyes for his Father's glory, and so did not grasp the throne, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Lord, we thank you that his kingship so characterizes our lives. We pray it would all the more as you pour your spirit out on us and as we soak ourselves in his word. We thank you for our fellowship, which is a slice of heaven, and we pray, Lord God, that as we live and follow the Lord Jesus, he would receive all the glory. In his name we pray. Amen. We're going to close with a hymn. Um, Praise my soul, the King of Heaven.